Hello, welcome everybody. This is Transparency Matters, presentation by the League of Women Voters of Johnson County as part of our lecture series. And tonight we are in person as well as being um, streamed on the library's channel. And this program will be recorded so that it can be rebroadcast on both the library channel and the League of Women Voters website. So I'm Patty McCarthy. I serve with Rebecca Connard, who's tuning in from someplace sunny, I hope, uh, and Linda Schreiber, who is here with us on the League's Education Committee to organize this series to help fulfill the League's mission of ensuring that we have an informed electorate. So the League is very pleased to recognize our series partners as well as our very distinguished partners uh, who will speak to you in a few minutes and drove a little bit, said the roads weren't too bad. Yay, the first snowstorm we have is when we're doing this, but that's okay. Anyway, our partners are the Gazette for providing publicity and the Iowa City Public Library for providing the space, the streaming services, and other technical expertise, which will enable us to rebroadcast the program. Um, before introducing our first speaker, I want you to please take a minute and silence your cell phones. Just make sure they are on silent. Our plan tonight is to hear from both of our speakers, and then we will open it up to questions from those of you who are here tonight. Uh, we will be using a microphone to ensure that everyone can hear the questions, so please don't start asking until we get to you with the microphone. Linda will be in charge of that. So, transparency matters in government and the media. Our 2021 Nobel Peace Prize recipient and journalist, Maria Ressa, said the ability to discern and question is crucial to both journalism and democracy, to hold leaders accountable. Without the integrity of facts, and this statement came from her acceptance speech, um, for the Nobel Peace Prize, one of the first journalists with a Russian journalist to ever receive that honor. Without the integrity of facts, you don't have the integrity of elections. Without facts, you don't have the truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without trust, we have no shared reality, no democracy, and it becomes impossible to deal with the world's existential problems. She went on to talk about pandemics and many other issues that we face, but we know that transparency means literally knowing the details, the cost, implementation plan for new government initiatives, and we know that and hope those details are not decided behind closed doors and then revealed to us. Transparency is as fundamental to journalists whose they let us in on the cronyism. If you read the Gazette today, you saw an article about some relationships that are being questioned. Um, corruption, lies, disinformation. In spite of the unprecedented challenges to newspapers and the media that are facing revenue losses, um, attacks on journalists, and of course the never-ending combating of fake information. So transparency being the fundamental basis of both democracy and journalism, and the quest for transparency is basically what these guys do day in and day out. So it is my pleasure and honor, actually, now to introduce two of Iowa's most, um, I would call them rock star journalists that we have. <laughs> Superstars, we'll leave it there. Randy Evans is the executive director of the Iowa Freedom of Information Council and contributor to Iowa Capital Dispatch. And Laura Bellin is the editor of the Bleeding Heartland blog and a member of the Iowa Writers Collaborative. So as I said, we're going to first hear from Randy and then Laura, but a little bit more about him. <sighs> I'm, this is, <laughs> as a 40, after a 40-year career with the Des Moines Register as a reporter, 
state editor, metro editor, news editor, assistant managing editor, and editor of the Register's opinion pages, Mr. Evans became executive director of the Iowa Freedom of Information Council. After retiring from the Register, he also began writing a weekly column on government and politics for the Bloomfield Democrat. It now appears regularly in eight to 10, right, newspapers and websites and the Iowa Capital Dispatch. Ms. Bellin, who did say I could call her Lauren, and Randy said I could call him Randy. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm sure they will not mind if you address them that way too. Uh, Ms. Bellin began her writing career as an analyst for the Prague-based Open Media Research Institute and later for Radio Free Europe, Radio, Euro, Radio, Radio Liberty, covering Russian campaigns and elections, parliamentary politics, and media issues. Now she's primarily known as a journalist who follows Iowa politics and has been named by national media as the hardest working and perhaps the most uh, best, I'm sorry, the best political reporter in the state. During the pandemic, she began working part-time uh, for KHOI, Community Radio in Ames, and is the State House correspondent for them. Her Le Bleeding Heartland columns are a must-read if you follow Iowa politics and the state capitol. And last year, they posted 550 articles to that blog. So Mr. Evans, Randy, will speak first. And I'll tell you in April, the League of Women Voters of Iowa will be honoring the Iowa Freedom of Information Council for defending democracy. So it's Executive Director Randy Evans. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to, uh, to be with all of you here today. Uh, as I said uh, in our conversation beforehand, I, uh, uh, the League has a soft spot in my heart, a special place. Back in my weekly newspaper career, uh, when I was the editor of the two weekly newspapers in Albia, Iowa, one of my good friends was the uh, first woman to run for the U.S. House uh, in Iowa. And you'll think this was something in the, the latter years of the 20th century. It was Ruth Hollingshead who ran in, I think it was 1938. Uh, and she said that she knew that she voted for herself she wasn't going to guarantee that her husband voted for her. <laughs> the Iowa legislature wrote uh, the state's laws on uh, citizen access to government records and government meetings 50 years ago. The concept behind these two laws is really uh, quite simple. The people deserve to watch and to have input into the decisions that their governments make and people are entitled to uh, have access to government records, most government records, so that they can understand the background, the basis, and the rationale for decisions government makes or decides not to make. My entire working life uh, as a journalist covers this same time span. Uh, and I have tried during those uh, decades to uh, inform the public about decisions and the debates and the inner workings of state and local governments uh, in Iowa. And for the last seven plus years, in my role with the Iowa Freedom of Information Council, I have appeared before government boards and councils. I have written to government leaders. I have testified before subcommittees of the Iowa legislature. And I have been hip deep in multiple lawsuits all in an attempt to make the case for the importance of preserving and improving government transparency and accountability to the citizens of Iowa. I want to share some observations and some concerns about the state of government transparency in our state. In the 56 years since I had my first byline in the Bloomfield Democrat when I was a 16-year-old high school kid, I have never seen our state and local governments less transparent than they are right now. The attitude these days seems to be, if you don't like it, sue us. Because government knows that most people cannot afford to spend fifty, seventy-five thousand, dollars or $100,000 to sue government. 
Transparency, uh, I would hasten to add, is not an issue where one party understands it and the other party doesn't. It's a, a matter of the people who are in government and who hold government offices are much less interested in transparency than they were when they were on the outside trying to get into office. I want to highlight a few specific areas of concern that the FOI Council has. The cost of public records continues to be the single biggest obstacle that stands in the way of citizen access to government records. Last year, to its credit, the legislature amended the law to emphasize that the cost of records needs to be reasonable and that governments are encouraged, encouraged to uh, make no charge for records when the records can be retrieved and copied in 30 minutes or less. But what is reasonable to somebody who makes $40,000 a year is vastly different than what is reasonable to a corporation that makes profits of $40 million a year. And that uh, is one of the, the issues. And the other is that encouraged is not the same thing as required. The amended statute still allows government to charge for the time of outside lawyers to receive and review documents uh, for the presence of any confidential information. You don't see uh, government officials wanting to charge you if you're walking into uh, City Hall in Iowa City because you want to uh, develop a piece of vacant ground in the city for a, a new housing development or a new business development. You don't see them wanting to charge you $200 an hour uh, for city officials to, uh, to review your questions, to respond to your questions about what they have to go through. But somehow, when somebody wants to get public records, it is a burden on government and it's distracting government from their primary job if they have to take time to fill a public records request without being able to charge you. A retired government attorney in Des Moines told me over lunch a couple of years ago that when he was uh, uh, the city attorney in Des Moines, his role was to have his lawyers prepare a memo for city officials that would guide them through uh, a question about public records access. His role, he said, wasn't to uh, personally examine every scrap of paper that might be released to see whether there was confidential information in it. That's what government leaders would do if they were truly uh, believing in the spirit of the open meetings and open records laws. A few years ago, uh, a complaint was filed with the Iowa Public Information Board against the Cedar Falls School District. It was filed by a blogger from Northwest Iowa. He had asked for uh, emails that were exchanged by Cedar Falls school administrators, teachers, and community uh, organizers who were trying to uh, put together a trans week event on the grounds of the middle school. He had to pay $2,000 for copies of several dozen emails. The district uh, said, well, the, the expense was so high because they needed to have a lawyer review them for the presence of uh, confidential student information or confidential personnel uh, information. It's interesting to a kid from southern Iowa that the lawyers who are doing this review, their offices are in West Des Moines. Oh. So those lawyers who were uh, being compensated at the rate of about $200 an hour for their time, they wouldn't know who any name that popped up in an email, who was a, a school teacher, a school administrator, a community organizer, or a student. But that's okay because the purpose of the $2,000 cost wasn't to recover the expenses or to protect the privacy of people. It was to save the school district from the embarrassment and it was to try to dissuade the, the blogger from pursuing the records that he was after. The same thing occurred uh, during the uh, 
early months of the pandemic, Clark Kaufman of Iowa Capital Dispatch filed a public records request for emails and postal letters that were exchanged by the state epidemiologist in Iowa and experts at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention who were offering their guidance on how Iowa could uh, uh, help guard against COVID outbreaks in the meatpacking plants in Iowa. There was no question that these communications were a public record in the definition of the public records law. But Kaufman was told by state officials that he would have to pay $9,000 to retrieve and copy the documents. You know, I'm no uh, uh, expert, but that didn't pass the smell test. If his request had been handed off to a, uh, an employee of the Iowa Department of Public Health who was making $75,000 a year, the state was saying, in effect, that it would take that person six weeks of full-time work to retrieve and make copies of the letters and the emails that he wanted. No way, no how. The problem, as I see it, is that the fees that are being charged for records are not a matter of government trying to hold down its expenses or trying to recover the cost of its out-of-pocket uh, outlays. The fees are being used as a way to club people who make public records requests to discourage them from asking for copies of records in the first place. Government doesn't want to be embarrassed by what might be in those records. There's a recent example that's closer to Iowa City. A few weeks ago, I asked Kirkwood Community College for a copy of the settlement agreement that the college entered into with a, a, a sculptor from uh, New York State who had uh, created a 14-foot tall piece of art for Kirkwood's uh, hotel and, and conference center in Cedar Rapids. Such legal agreements are public records. The Code of Iowa says that in black and white. The law, uh, though, certainly didn't contemplate the, the response that the college gave me. The college was more interested in, in avoiding embarrassing publicity about the lawsuit and the settlement rather than living up to the spirit of the Sunshine Laws. The college informed me that it, I would have to pay $100 for this two-page settlement agreement. The cost was that high, they said, because the college needed two hours of senior employees' time to locate and to format the agreement and to send it to me via a secure computer connection. Sitting down at the computer and doing a search and finding it and hitting the print button and sticking it in an envelope and paying 60 cents to mail it to me apparently was not in the cards. The death of George Floyd illustrates another way in which Iowa law is out of sync with the public records laws in many other states. Within days of Floyd's uh, tragic death, the public knew about the discipline history of Officer Derek Chauvin, who was later convicted of murder in uh, Floyd's death. If this tragedy had occurred in Iowa, the people of the state still would not know about the officer's discipline uh, history and any past infractions uh, that he was involved with unless those infractions had led to uh, his termination or his resignation in lieu of termination or to a demotion. And none of those happened in uh, Derek Chauvin's case. And that's been, and the reason the, for the secrecy in Iowa is because government is more interested and more concerned about facing a possible lawsuit from a, a government employee than they are concerned about facing a possible lawsuit from a media group or a citizens group. And this isn't right. You know, the government in Iowa, whether we're talking Iowa City, the public schools, Johnson County, the state of Iowa, government belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to the government officials. 
And I believe that people, the owners of government, are entitled to know how their employees are disciplined or how they aren't disciplined for their actions on the job. One egregious example, uh, a few days after Derek Chauvin uh, was involved in the death of George Floyd, there were protests at the Iowa Capitol in, this, in Des Moines. Des Moines Register reporter Katie Aiken was covering the protests. At a certain point that night, uh, the uh, Des Moines police and Iowa State Patrol troopers uh, gave the order that the crowd had to, be, had to disperse or they would face arrest. Aiken complied fully with that order. She began walking rapidly down the hill uh, away from the Capitol to, uh, to abide by the officer's directive. But a Des Moines police officer chased her down as she was walking away from the Capitol, circled around in front of her, and then sprayed her in the face with tear gas, all while she was holding up her media credentials and saying loudly, press, press, media, I'm press, I'm press. She was not breaking the law, but I think there's a case to be made that the officer may have broken the law, but we don't know uh, what happened to the officer because two and a half years later, Des Moines police still refused to say how or if the officer was disciplined in any way. A less... Uh, egregious example, perhaps. Uh, a few years ago, a Des Moines officer was pulling off of Interstate 235 on one of the exits. She was talking on her cell phone at the same time. And at the end of the exit ramp, there was a red traffic signal and a sign that said, no right turn on red. But the officer was distracted or she simply disregarded the sign and the red light. And she made a right turn on the red light and in doing so, she knocked an elderly woman to the ground with her car. The woman was out walking her dog and was crossing in a marked crosswalk with a green light. The uh, police didn't charge the uh, officer with any traffic offense. Uh, and, you know, if you or I were the one who was involved in that, we probably wouldn't have gotten the same courtesy. But the police said that... Uh, it was going to be handled internally because there was much wider range of punishment that was available. But when a TV reporter asked some weeks later how the officer was disciplined, police refused to tell her and reminded the reporter that disciplined cases are confidential. Such secrecy erodes the public confidence and trust in our law officers. The public gives considerable authority to law officers. We equip them with guns. We authorize them to take people's lives if necessary. But with that tremendous responsibility, there should come a way for the public to monitor and evaluate how our police officers and their bosses do their jobs. One more example that shows why, you know, the citizens of a community need to take a deep interest in, in how all of this is handled. I'm a citizen of Des Moines, I'm a taxpayer in Des Moines, and I was uh, stunned to find out a few years ago that $800,000 was going to be paid uh, to uh, a victim of a, a police misconduct incident. $800,000. Two officers were working in the Court Avenue entertainment area. They were not wearing uniforms, they had on blue polo shirts that apparently said Des Moines police on the, above the pocket. An out-of-town visitor, he was in town for a wrestling tournament, saw these two men arguing with a drunken woman. He didn't recognize them as police officers, and he thought that they might be accosting the woman. So he went up to them and said, what's going on? And they said, get out of here, leave the area. When he hung back because he was concerned what might happen to the woman, the officers threw him to the ground. They handcuffed him with his arms behind his back while he was on his stomach. And then they lifted him up onto his knees with their hands in his armpits. So he was on his knees, they lift him up, and then they let go. His hands are back here, there's no way to brace himself. 
He fell face forward onto the concrete. He broke his teeth, bones in his face. Secret discipline records are wrong, and this shows you why. A related issue of transparency and accountability involves video recorded by police with body-worn cameras or cameras mounted on their squad cars. Again, the practice in Iowa is out of sync with the practice in many other states. I point you to the school surveillance video from the elementary school in Uvalde, Texas. It was made public within a couple of weeks after the, the school uh, tragedy there. Had that occurred in Iowa, you wouldn't have seen the video of the police officers sort of hanging back uh, at the end of the hallway while gunshots were going off down the hallway. One example in Iowa that uh, still uh, troubles me greatly. In January of 2015, a Burlington police officer responded to a report of a husband and wife arguing outside of their home in Burlington. When the officer got out of his car and began walking up to the couple, who were one of the husband was holding their toddler son, the family dog came running around the corner of the house to see what was going on. The officer admitted later he was afraid of dogs. And that fear led him to pull out his, his service weapon and to fire two shots at the dog. He missed the dog, but he killed Autumn Steele. That incident was recorded on the officer's body camera, but the city and the state of Iowa spent the next eight years fighting to keep from having to release that video. They assert it was to protect the sanctity of police investigations, but that's not true. It was really to avoid embarrassment, the embarrassment that comes from a police officer's carelessness ending up taking the life of a 34-year-old mother and forever changing her husband and her son's lives. The Iowa FOI Council regularly hears about what we believe are abuses of the personnel exemption, as it's called in the public meetings law. This exemption allows government boards to meet uh, behind closed doors to discuss the, uh, the professional evaluations of government employees to keep from needless and irreparable harm to the person's reputation. The uh, DeWitt School Board met last year with uh, their superintendent uh, to discuss his personal evaluation. The DeWitt Observer newspaper sued after they learned that this uh, closed session was in reality a, a discussion of uh, the superintendent's decision to remove some books from school library or school classrooms. And the, the, the excuse of uh, professional evaluation was a pretext because how many of you have sat through your own uh, job evaluations and had your coworkers sitting in on that discussion with your bosses. The superintendent, uh, when he met with the school board, the other building principals were also in the meeting. And one day after the, this professional evaluation was held, the superintendent returned the books to the school classrooms. The, uh, the discussion actually that went on there was about the school district's policy over when to remove books and when to leave them in the school libraries and the school classrooms. And that discussion was not a professional evaluation. That was a public policy discussion that the citizens of the DeWitt School District were entitled to sit in on, to offer their comments, and to see what the school board members said or didn't say. The situation in DeWitt with the school board is not unique. One day after the school massacre in Uvalde, Texas, the Bettendorf School Board met with about 200 parents who were angry about uh, violence, 
harassment, incidents of bullying that had been going on for the entire school year at the Bettendorf Middle School. There's no greater issue of importance in public education these days than the safety and the well-being of students. But the Bettendorf School Board had the district's communications director stand at the door to the building where the meeting was held to turn away reporters who showed up to cover the meeting, to turn away other parents who were not middle school parents. In my 50 years as a journalist in Iowa, in my seven years as the executive director of the FOI Council, I have never seen a more egregious example of an abuse of the public meetings laws occurred in Bettendorf. I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think that that complied with the uh, open meeting statute. And that's the reason that the council uh, and the three TV stations and newspaper in the Quad Cities uh, have sued the school district uh, I am very confident that we're going to prevail. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it would be accurate to say that uh, I believe the Bettendorf School District is interested in what it would take to resolve our dispute. One last example. Last spring, Des Moines School Superintendent Tom Ahart announced that he would retire at the end of uh, that last school year in June of 2022. He still had one year left on his uh, contract. The school board had a public meeting that lasted two minutes. Uh, the law, I would say, would, I would remind you, says basically that any time that uh, you have uh, a quorum of, of members of a government board who gather to talk about government business, that constitutes a meeting. So how it is that uh, all of this, what, that what occurred was decided without there being a public meeting is just baffling. In this two minute meeting with no explanation, no discussion, the board voted to accept Tom Ahart's uh, retirement request. The board also voted to pay him $400,000 in salary and benefits for the final year of his contract, the year that he wouldn't be working. Taxpayers who had questions about why the school uh, district would pay an employee, basically the equivalent of nine starting salaries for our teachers, why they would pay somebody that much money for not working, they were out of luck because part of the agreement that was presented to them at the meeting that they have voted for without discussion, said that they would answer no questions. And you wonder why I have white hair. <laughs> I want to turn the microphone over to Laura, and I would, uh, I would second the comments you're talking to about somebody here who is the hardest working reporter in Iowa I read her every day because I want to know what's going on with my government. I mean, where would we be without the Iowa Freedom of Information Council? Honestly, yeah. they do so much. And I don't deal very much in my reporting. I don't deal often with law enforcement agencies. But it's such a huge problem in government transparency. And I'm really glad that Randy is always on the case and he spent a fair amount of time talking about it. I want to just hit on a few points that Randy didn't mention that affect my daily life. And I want to make sure that we leave time for your questions because I'm sure that people have a lot of questions here. One of the issues is that we have to, reporters have to file a lot of public records requests because we can't just get basic questions answered. And so the state government agencies often complain, especially during the pandemic, the Iowa Department of Public Health complained that it, they were dealing with this multitude of public records requests. But that was largely because we just couldn't 
get anyone to even answer an email. And I deal with this regularly with the governor's office. And there was a long period where the governor's office wasn't even responding to public records requests. So I'm always having to find some end run around, you know, submitting a records request to the Department of Administrative Services or the Department of Management. But it's tricky and it would be a lot easier if they would just answer the question. And uh, also, sometimes when you get the record, then they don't answer any of the follow-up questions. So I had one of my guest authors, John Morrissey, he spent months last year researching a piece about, if you remember the state trooper Ted Benda who died after the single vehicle crash. And uh, John discovered that the, the vehicle model, the Dodge Charger that he was driving had been rated as having poor performing headlights. And he just couldn't get anybody from the Department of Public Safety to answer any questions about whether were they looking at this? Was there any, are they going to adjust any of their training? Are they going to think about purchasing different vehicles? I mean, he just, just radio silence. He was able eventually finally to get an incident report about it, but then he just couldn't get any questions answered. And, it, and since the governor hasn't had a press conference since last July, she very rarely is even taking informal questions at what's called a gaggle, like after a public event, she very rarely is even taking a few questions. So there's just no opportunity to get the questions answered that you need. And not everything can be acquired through a public records request. And it's just, it's very difficult. I, I haven't been in journalism for as long as Randy, but I regularly hear from people, journalists, longtime journalists, retired journalists, that it's never been this bad. I mean, that is a very consensus view in Iowa. Another issue is slow walking requests. So this is not out and out and out denying, but uh, something that might take a few minutes, like that settlement agreement from Kirkwood College, in addition to overcharging, sometimes what I find is that the agency doesn't charge me any money, but they just make me wait six weeks, eight weeks. You know, It might not be timely by the time I get the record. And in some cases, I've submitted very narrow requests and had to wait weeks and weeks to get the material. And I know that this isn't a universal phenomenon because last year I had occasion to request records from the state of Alaska. When I got the records, it turned out to be a story that I didn't think was newsworthy enough to write about, but it related to somebody who is in state government in Iowa who does some side work in Alaska. And I filed a request for a year or a year and a half's worth of invoices that this person's company had submitted to the state of Alaska. And I'm not joking, I sent the records request in the morning, Alaska time, afternoon, my time. And I had like a 50 page PDF file the next afternoon. I mean, I was just stunned. I wouldn't get, if I requested one document, a single document from a state government agency, there was no way they would ever send that to me the next day, no matter how. So somebody had compiled, had done the search for these invoices, had put it all in a PDF and gotten it turned around to me right away. And, and I wasn't even somebody who had a relationship with this state government agency. So I was really, that's just an ongoing frustration. I've been dealing with a state government agency where I've requested agreements, salary sharing agreements. This is a, I request these records every year. They know exactly what I'm looking for. And they made me wait about two months for them. And then I requested also these, these documents showing transfers of funds from one agency to another. Still don't have those. And we're talking about like maybe eight transfers total over a fiscal year. There's no way that it could be taking them this long. But, you know, here I am. I can't do anything about it. They'll probably send it to me on one of the busiest news days at the legislature. This has happened to me before. The Iowa Department of Public Health one time sent me an enormous batch of documents on the day in October of 2021 that the legislature approved the redistricting plan. So they obviously knew that I was going to be tied up reporting on that. Uh, state agencies more and more now are running all the records requests through the governor's office. This is something that wasn't done routinely in past administrations. I've talked to people who work for past governors of both parties. And it came out, if you followed the lawsuit that Polly Carver Kim filed against the state, she was the longtime public information officer for the Department of Public Health. She was fired a few months into the, or not, well, technically she wasn't fired. She was told she had a choice of resigning or being fired. And she stepped down, but she's filed a wrongful termination suit. And she said that it, she had handled public records requests for all of that time. And I had dealt with Polly. I didn't very often request records from the Department of Public Health, but I had found her fairly easy to deal with. But now everything, not just the pandemic-related things, but everything was having to go through the governor's office. And that 
incurred more delay because they were getting all of the requests from all of the state agencies. Also, the Office of Chief Information Officer now is a part of state government that often they conduct the email searches. So sometimes when I email somebody weeks later to say, hey, what's going on with my records request? They'll say, oh, OCIO is working on that, or it's in line for OCIO to search the email. So they don't have somebody in that state agency doing it. Uh, another issue is finding ways to elude. This is another thing that came out of Polly Carver Kim's lawsuit. Um, using ways to either change the email address or some way to not work over the emails that you've requested. One thing that I do, and if you ever make a records request to a state or a local government agency, don't ever specify a certain email address. Like, like say if, if you want emails to or from Randy Evans, don't say like, you know, Randy Evans at yahoo.com, which isn't his real email address, but because he might have multiple email addresses and he might use the more uh, one for more important correspondence. And this came up during the pandemic because there were some other reporters who had requested records to and from certain individuals within the Department of Public Health. And according to Polly Carver Kim's lawsuit, all of these people started using different email addresses that were associated with the emergency command center in Johnston where they were working in the early weeks of the pandemic. And she could see that those emails that began with ECC something something, none of those emails were being searched. And so people weren't getting the records that were responsive to their requests. So I mean, I have multiple email addresses myself. So I would just say always if you're name the person, but don't give the person's email. And another trick of the trade that I picked up a few years ago, a former government employee told me that I had been really close to getting <laughs> a really good newsworthy email. And I had requested emails to and from John Doe, and they had determined that they didn't have to give me this email because John Doe wasn't the sender and wasn't the recipient. He was copied on the email. <laughs> So now, <laughs> I always say I have language that I put in all my records requests. When I'm asking for, e for written correspondence, I'll say a written correspondence includes but is not limited to uh, you know, mailed letters, memorandums, emails, and if it's email correspondence, I'm interested in any that are accessible from this person's account, whether or not this person was this, the original sender, the main recipient, or copied on the correspondence. And this, unfortunately, this is what you have to do. And I have no doubt that in previous administrations, this email would have been turned over to me, because it's clearly, it was an email that the person received. He was copied on the email. So uh, this is just... <laughs> this is the kind of thing we have to deal with. Another thing that I find more and more often is that if, if you're asking for emails related to some event, they'll ask you for keywords to search. Again, this is for the Office of Chief Information Officer. And that's really difficult when you can't look at the correspondence yourself because you don't exactly know. There might be relevant discussions that don't use certain magic words or phrases. So you don't want to phrase it too narrowly because then you'll miss something. But you can't phrase it too broadly. Otherwise, like Randy was saying with Clark Kaufman, they come back and they say that it turned up thousands of emails and that'll cost you thousands of dollars. And one example of this that I had last year, I, had, I was seeking records related to the governor used the State Historical Building Terrace to deliver the State of the Union response. And I learned that she wasn't charged. Normally, you would have to pay to rent that space, and I learned that the governor's office wasn't, wasn't charged any fee for it. So I was requesting records, but they were asking me for keywords, and it's really difficult because you can't... At first, I said, like, terrace or state historical building terrace. Well, you can't do that because every email that references Terrace Hill or, you know, certain people who work for the governor have even Terrace Hill in their signature of their email, so that is a disaster. And, and State of the Union, I mean, it's a difficult phrase because not all of it, I mean, not all of the messages would have included state of the union, right? Then many things that have nothing to do with that would include the word state, right? Or the word union. So it becomes really difficult. And I know that it, I'm sure it would have been easy for somebody in the office just to look at whatever during this period of a couple of weeks when they were planning. It wouldn't have been hard for them to just look for the correspondence, but they're claiming they can't do this and the Office of 
chief information officer needs keywords to search. And uh, that's really tricky. And I have, I'm going to close with one last story before I, uh, before I open it up for questions. Uh, Longtime readers of my website know that about six years ago, I, I went down the rabbit hole of investigating Stephen Leith, the then president of Iowa State University. And this involved many <laughs> records requests and exchanges with his assistant. But I got a tip. I was never able to nail it down. It was, I will just tell you that it was a legitimate newsworthy story if it had panned out that was related to a dog. And so I filed a records request for a certain date range, it, including emails to or from Stephen Leith that included the word dog or puppy. And Iowa State came back to me and said that there were like 300 responsive records to my request and it would cost $120. And I was like, wow, 300, you know, I'm like really onto something. So I paid the $120. I mean, honestly, that was, but I was like, I'm going to, I want to see what's in this. So they sent me the documents on Christmas Eve. They emailed the records to me. I'm Jewish. I don't celebrate Christmas, but anyway, but so they sent me the records when they knew that I wouldn't really be able to do anything with it. And they, fewer than five of this whole huge document were actual emails that referenced a dog in some way. Stephen Leith must have set up some kind of Google News alert with a word dog in it because the vast majority of the emails were just Google News alert headlines with stories that had something to do with dog. And I complained to Iowa State because I said, come on. I mean, you had to know when you pulled up these records that most of these had nothing to do with anything. And it wouldn't take any lawyer any time to review emails that are just Google. And they did refund 90 of my $120. They said that the $30 for the first hour, they wouldn't, they wouldn't refund. But, but so that, so anyway, I wasn't, if, if, if this thing happened, he must have used the phone or a private email <laughs> that I couldn't access. And that's another thing. Private, if, if government officials use private emails for official business, that's a public record. And I do always, I mean, for, depending on the records request, but sometimes I've put in that email, by the way, if somebody used a private cell phone or a private email account, I want that to be searched. But you know that they're not really searching those. I mean, I've never gotten... I've never gotten a text message or supposedly Governor Reynolds uses like an Apple Watch. So I always include that in my records request to the governor's office. I always say like written correspondence includes this, that, and the other. And any messages from instant messaging devices, it, including but not limited to an Apple Watch. But I've never gotten anything. So whether she does, they, supposedly she doesn't use email. So it there's like Terry Branstad also supposedly didn't use email. Right. So, you know, you can't, it's very difficult, but in theory, they're supposed to search those things. So anyway, that, that's some of, some of my adventures with a lack of transparency in state government and local government. I haven't dealt with this often, but I know that many local governments are just as bad. The city of Muscatine uh, used to be really terrible. They tried to charge huge fees for just records that were like legal, like bills from the law firm to the city. That couldn't be something that would need to be redacted, really. And it wouldn't take a long time to compile either. So. Oh, you, you silly child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why would we want that? <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much. Wow. Yeah. wow, my head's just going to take a little while to wrap my head around all that information. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, I will say we have one more educational program before we get into to questions. Our March program is Women's History Abortion. We will have Patricia Cohen, who is an internationally recognized um, expert on the history of abortion, who will be here in meeting room A. Her research and her teaching interests span US women's history, the history of sexuality, the history of journalism, and 19th century health and sex reformers. She will be joined by the University of Iowa Gender, Women's Sexuality Studies and History professor, Lena Maria Murillo. So that promises to also be a really interesting topic and we hope that you'll put um, March 23rd, oh my gosh, I should have looked this up. Okay, I'll, I'll look this up while we're asking questions on the uh, calendar. And don't forget the league's legislative forms, which are on the fourth Saturday of the month when the legislature is in session. So we have one coming up 
Saturday, January 28th, February 25th, and March 25th. So now for questions, and I'm sure there are many. Linda will bring you the microphone. So Linda, we've got here, and then this gentleman over there. Uh, thank you both for being here. Could you talk a little about the treatment of journalists at the state capitol? have the same privileges as other journalists at the Capitol. The Iowa Senate last year kicked all of the reporters out of the chamber. There are press, if you've ever been in the legislative chambers, there are press benches. They were expressly built for that purpose where journalists have worked for more than 100 years, literally. And the Senate leadership has had constructed instead in the public gallery, which is up high, obstructed view, can't always hear don't have access to the legislators when the chamber is at ease. They've set up some tables that reporters can use. And at the time when journalists were able to cover the Iowa Senate, I was never allowed to sit on the press bench in the chamber. But now that they have this area set up that is very difficult to work in, I've been told I can, I'm free to use that area by the Secretary of the Iowa Senate. But the Iowa House, which it never, for many years never had a written policy on which journalists were allowed to cover. They just, they took applications and many people were credentialed and some of those were assigned seats in the press bench. Uh, after the first time that I applied for credentials in 2019, I was denied. And then about a month later, they issued their first written policy about that. They've since changed that policy twice every time I demonstrate that I meet the terms of the policy. So the Iowa House last year and this year, they have credentialed almost everyone who applied except for three people. I, this is, there could be a much longer story, but Jacob Hall, this uh, blogger from Northwest Iowa, was one who was also excluded. Jack Hunt, who owns and operates the Iowa Legislative News Service, which is kind of like a newsletter for lobbyists, he was excluded, and he's been up there since the 1980s. And the person he bought the Iowa Legislative News Service from had been up there since the 1960s, always credentialed every year until I started having my problems. And I, I think that Jacob and Jack would probably both, I mean, I think they would both agree that they are collateral damage to my situation, that the Iowa House just can't really they realized that they wouldn't be able to justify credentialing them without credentialing me. So uh, I do not have access. And it is difficult because the, when Pat Grassley has talks to the journalists who are right there on the press bench, even Monday night after they passed the voucher bill in the House, afterwards the journalists who have seats on the press bench were able to talk to some of the legislators who were still in the chamber, and that's something that I can't do because I don't have the same access. I will say generally that there is less access. The, the leadership used to have weekly press conferences, on usually on Thursdays. But the Iowa Senate leadership, I don't think they had a press conference the entire 2021 session or the 2022 session. The, Pat Grassley in the House, he was having, most weeks, he was having some kind of informal session with journalists. But the Iowa Senate, they just don't arrange for journalists to ask questions. And it is difficult. I mean, I've never had that access, so for me, it's it's annoying, but I haven't lost that. But for the journalists who have worked for many years, having that access and not being able to sit on the press bench, they will tell you how much of a difference it makes, that if they're trying to write about a bill and they can't just motion over the person, the bill sponsor, to answer their question, and the people don't always respond to emails or phone calls, it's very difficult just to get the basic information to try to be accurate. One of the things I would add is that back in my previous life, uh, I was, uh, I mentioned I was the editor of the newspapers in Albia. And this was in the, uh, uh, the early 1970s. And one of the issues in Iowa at that time was uh, Governor Robert Ray was trying to uh, boost the, the coal mining industry in Iowa. Uh, the last under my underground coal mine in Iowa was in Monroe County. And, and I had questions about what the governor was doing. And I called, you know, I had never been to the governor's office. Uh, and I called his press secretary to say, you know, I had these questions. And, and he said, well, I can get you the answers, but why don't you just come on 
to the, the governor's press conference in two or three days. Uh, and now, you know, you can't even remember when the last press conference was held. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that access is information. Yeah. And Terry Branstad, when he had, he had a weekly press conference on Monday mornings, almost all the time, it was extremely rare for him to miss that. And he would start out talking about the topic that he wanted the reporters to write about, but he would talk about that for a few minutes and maybe have somebody come on to speak about it. But then he would take questions on a wide range of whatever people brought to the table. When the governor, this governor does have a press conference, like the, she had a couple last summer in June and July, she she has her spiel and she has speakers talking about the thing and then she'll say I'll take questions on the topic and then they cut it off before they don't she doesn't just open it up to any questions about anything so it's really problematic when you're working on a story and you can't and her press secretary even won't get back to you and I thought that it was mainly directed at me. Sometimes I forget that this isn't something just affecting me because I mean, the Des Moines Register can't get a sit-down interview with this governor of the Cedar Rapids Gazette can't, and even the Northwest Iowa Review, which is a conservative-owned newspaper covering an area in Northwest Iowa, they couldn't get an interview with the governor. They couldn't get the governor's press secretary to answer a few questions submitted by email. I mean, it's stunning. You can't say liberal media bias. I mean, it's up, they, they definitely are not. I mean, it's a solid newspaper, but it certainly is not a liberal newspaper. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, I've kind of got a, a two-part question. Um, <clears throat> you know, we talk about transparency and accountability. How do you actually bring transparency to an entity that does not want to be transparent? For the, tra for the past two and a half years, I've been trying to bring transparency and accountability to the Johnson County Sheriff's Department for two of their officers on lawful actions. I've got the body cam videos, I've got the emails, um, I've got everything here and they continue to deny it. So I just, I don't know, how do you bring transparency to it if they don't want to be transparent? And the second part of the question is, is you know, you talk about the body cam videos, you know, I have those. What good are they if they just modify and edit them to suit their agenda? Well, because, I, because the body cam videos are not accurate for, for, what, for what happened. I mean, I think the, there are a couple of points here. One is, uh, you know, how do you bring transparency? And that's, you know, I think the, uh, the most potent tool is, is the public spotlight. And whether that is, uh, you know, trying to get uh, journalists interested in, in digging into it, or whether it is uh, using social media. Uh, you know, it used to be, you know, you had to be uh, super wealthy to uh, own a printing press, and now, you know, the high school kid or the junior high kid next door could, could help you with uh, the technology. Because ultimately, it comes down to uh, the voters, you know, when you're, you're dealing with an elected official. Uh, but, you know, also I would say find others in the community who share your interests or your concerns. I've been trying. And, and, and it's... Did they release emails to you, but you think they were redacted, or do you think they didn't release? I've got all the emails. I've got all the information that shows that, you know, that they committed, you know, lawful, unlawful actions. They just won't, they just deny it. They, they just won't admit it. I've got the body cam videos, I've got the emails, I've, I've got everything. And, and they refuse to even meet with my wife and I. That's another thing that's kind of disappointing. So when you talk about getting turned away, you know, it's, we get the same thing. Because, uh, you know, if they can't explain their written comments on their reports, I don't think they should be in law enforcement. I mean, one of the things I would also look at, uh, and this is kind of the old newspaper editor in me, you know, sort of coaching, and that's, I would curl up with the, uh, uh, the Code of Iowa that deals with the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy because uh, the... I've been through the Law Enforcement Academy myself. Oh. Officers. So then my final suggestion is uh, talking with the, the ACLU of Iowa. Uh, you struck a... Yeah, I've I, I contacted your, your group also. I've contacted a lot of, a lot of people, and uh, I, just, I just can't get the interest there. For some reason, I just can't get the interest. 
So I, I guess they just believe the police, you know. Well, before you leave here today, stop by and get my card. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are journalists um, starting to network and um, find ways around, like, those particular situations where, for instance, you're excluded? Can you feed questions to colleagues? Or are, are journalists working together to support each other to, um, you know, deal with this situation? It's hard. I am a member of the Iowa Capital Press Association, and I think that within some reason, I think they have tried to advocate, but I, I can't say that they've offered. I mean, sometimes, for instance, if I couldn't get into a press availability, somebody will make the audio or the video available to me later. So, I mean, it's not as quite as good at, at being as being there because I can't get the story as quickly, but at least, I mean, I would say that there has been some help. I don't hasn't been it hasn't happened where people routinely ask me like hey what's question would you like me to ask and part of that is that they, they have so few opportunities to ask questions themselves so they're not it's not like the governor is standing up there for 20 minutes taking everybody's questions and they'll they'll be happy to ask mine after they ask theirs and the chances are they won't even get to ask about what they want to know so but i think that the Iowa Capital Press Association was formed in 2020 because many people who had been covering the state house for a long time were so concerned about where, the way things were going. And I would say they've had mixed success because you may have heard that their, the annual pre-legislative session forum was canceled this year because none of the Republican leaders agreed to participate. Now, personally, if it had been, I'm not on the executive committee, but I would have just held the event with empty chairs for the leaders. And if the Democrat, if the minority party wanted to come and participate in the forum, they can do that. But that was, I wasn't in charge of deciding how to organize the forum. Thank you both for being here. Thanks to the League of Women Voters and the Public Library for actually um, recording this for other people to listen to in the future. There's a pretty big crowd here tonight. I think this subject matter um, has gone unnoticed, and I am appreciative of a light being shown on how corrupt um, things are happening in our state at a very fast and furious pace. Um, my question is, well, comment, question. Since the voucher bill was such a ramrod thing, and I, this is just hearsay on Facebook, but one Republican legislator was quoted, or I heard said, well, if the public doesn't like what we're doing, why do we keep getting voted in? Mm -hmm. And Several of them said that during the debate. Yeah. And it's like, really? I mean, I just think people need to understand that there's a depth there that the public doesn't know what's going on. That's why they're voting for you, for one thing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, could you speak to the fact that our representatives are not really being truthful and honest, not only to you, the press, but to the constituents for who they work for. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if that's related to transparency or not. Well, but. I, I thought one of the most absurd moments in the Iowa House debate was when, if you were following this issue closely, so they fast-tracked this bill, and one way they did that was by changing the chamber rules so that it wouldn't have to go through the Appropriations Committee and the Ways and Means Committee, and that would have not only slowed it down, but I, I think that it's very possible that they wouldn't have been able to get the bill out of the Ways and Means Committee in particular. There were several very determined Republican opponents of the bill on that committee. But in any case, the, when uh, Dave Jacoby, who represents the Coralville District and is the ranking Democrat on Ways and Means, or has been for a long time, and he stood up and questioned the bill's floor manager about well, why didn't you go this go through Ways and Means? And he said, well, we've been talking about this for years. I mean, we've had Ways and Means committees. We, of course, this year's bill was so vastly different from anything the Iowa House considered in the past. I mean, to say that, that this is something we've talked about before is just outlandish. I mean, the price tag, the number of people affected, everything about this proposal was way different, but he was saying, and he was also one of the legislators who said, well, people must want this because we won the election and the governor wanted this and she won the election as if 
that was the main issue. And, and we all know that votes, voters are complicated, right? The Des Moines Register poll from September or October showed that 25% of the people who were planning to vote for Kim Reynolds also said that abortion should be mostly or always legal. You know, so you, and so people don't always vote on, there, there might be lots of views they have that are at odds with how they vote. But in any case, that was from a transparency perspective. I mean, they did end up getting the fiscal analysis of the bill before they voted, but it looked like they were getting ready to vote on it before they even had any kind of fiscal note, let alone consideration by the key committees. I mean, it really is a lack of transparency. And just generally, the, when things move so quickly in the legislature, it's just usually a bad sign. I mean, one of the points I would also interject here is that the open meetings law that we've talked about does not apply to the Iowa legislature. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the Hooterville City Council uh, has to post an agenda for what is going to be discussed at their meeting. They have to post it at least 24 hours in advance. The legislature has no, you know, and it used to be they would provide you know, at least 24 hours advance notice before a, a subcommittee or a committee would meet. But now uh, that may be, you know, that notice may go out or go up on the, the website, you know, at night and it'll be an 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. gathering the next morning. You know, if you're in Hooterville, Iowa, you know, you can get across town in no time at all. But if you're in Lyon County or Lee County, uh, you know, Fremont or Alamo Key, you've got a long ways to drive if you're going to get to Des Moines, you know, for a, a 9 a.m. event. Uh, one other thing I would, a commercial, if you will, uh, you know, the, the FOI Council, you know, we, we operate on a shoestring, but, uh, you know, we're we're using leather strings now and not cotton. And, you know, we would certainly be willing to, uh, uh, to do a uh, how do you do it kind of session for, get, you know, how to write a, a public records request, uh, you know, what language to use, what, what are some of the, uh, the key phrases that you ought to make sure you include. It's sort of a news you can use kind of approach. And it is certainly that kind of an event fits in the, the league's budget, I can tell you, because it'll cost you zero. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I would okay. say yeah. tracking information on when meetings are held, it's, it's, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Unless you're very familiar with that website, it, it's very challenging. But. Well, and they always, it, every year I've been covering the legislature, some big bill comes up late in the game, a big amendment to a budget bill that is introduced late, so it doesn't even go through the regular committee process, and there's no opportunity to have public comment at a subcommittee. And there, there is language in the Constitution of Iowa that is supposed to say bills deal with a single subject, but this, as far as I can tell, this is just a dead letter because the case, the abortion case related to the 24-hour waiting period that the Iowa Supreme Court resolved last June, one of the ground, the district court had struck that down on two grounds. One was the violation of the fundamental right to an abortion, but the other was that this was a violation of the Constitution's single subject rule because of the way the legislature passed this in the middle of the night with no opportunity for public comment. And the Iowa Supreme Court said essentially, like, we don't tell the legislature how to do go about their business. So there, it, there's no way, I don't think anybody could possibly be successful on a lawsuit related to that. And I've seen, I remember a few years ago, there was something related to public utilities and I can't, now I can't remember if it was Bill Dotzler or Tony Bizignano was standing up. The Iowa Senate had an all night meeting that before that last day that they were about to adjourn. And it was like four in the morning or five in the morning. And this language was consequential relating to something, transmission lines. And he said, I can't even call my contacts because it's five in the morning. You know, I can't even, I don't even know. Some of this language is very technical. And this is all just being rammed through, and that happens, and a lot of it doesn't get 
much attention. I mean, only the thing, something like a 24-hour abortion waiting period got a lot of coverage, but there are many other things that are slipped into bills at the last minute on the Iowa House or Senate floor, and they don't get that level of scrutiny. Hi, uh, my name is Martha Hampel. I'm here on behalf of uh, the Iowa Civil Liberties Council. Um, a couple members of our group have been trying to reach um, different uh, state agencies. Um, Alexei Gertovoy, who is here, has emailed and sent letters to um, the Attorney General, both Tom Miller and Brenna Bird, um, the Secretary of State, um, regarding a, a voter privacy breach of two million Iowa voter records. Um, on the website voteref.com. Mm -hmm. You can all find your um, birthdays and uh, home addresses there. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, like Laura had mentioned, um, trying to get any kind of response from the state agencies is, is, has been impossible. Um, they just don't acknowledge your emails at all. Right, mm -hmm. right. And this is sort of a big deal. Even back, it was either 2016 or 2020, I can't remember, um, the Republican Party had um, uh, published all of the vote, Iowa voter records online, and it was covered by the Was Washington Post. But for some reason, this particular voter privacy breach is being completely ignored. Um, so I guess uh, I kind of have a two-part open-ended question um, I know there's a balance between election transparency and voter privacy that needs to be reached. What are your thoughts on this controversy? Um, what are your thoughts on how we can um, get anybody from the state to reply? We've even um, reached out to Iowa legislators. So, um, and, and if you're interested, there's more information on iowavoterprivacy.org mm -hmm. regarding this breach. Um, but what, what are your thoughts on this? What can we do m moving forward? Well, I'm, you know, I'm a, a big proponent, as you might have surmised, a big proponent in the public having access to information. Uh, you know, that's the way you know whether, you know, what your property is assessed at is comparable to other similar properties in your neighborhood. But, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, such a crazy person about this that that I want my date of birth and uh, you know out there where you know somebody who's out to uh, you know to hack my uh, credit card accounts or, or whatever would have access to it uh, you know so I'm I'm sympathetic you know Alexei is somebody that uh, uh, you know. I don't, uh, I don't imagine that he's taking uh, the lack of uh, response uh, quietly. Uh, but I think that, you know, if government officials aren't going to respond, you're in kind of a catch-22 because you don't want to shine the spotlight that makes public the existence of this, uh, you know, security breach that covers the vast majority of the states in the country. Uh, but, you know, I think that you may have a sympathetic uh, uh, entity in, you know, like the American Civil Liberties Union, because I think that ultimately it's going to come down to a court challenge. You know, if, if you've gone to the, the chief election officer in the state, the secretary of state, if you've gone to the chief law enforcement officer in the state, the attorney general, and you can't even get a, gee, thanks for bringing this to our attention, let us look into it, and then, you know, they wad it up and throw it away, uh, then I think the courts are your, your last recourse. Uh, what can you, because the voter file can be purchased, but so what information was made public that wouldn't be in, like if I went to the Secretary of State's office and bought the voter file for the entire state of Iowa? But would they sell it to you is one of the questions, I think. I think, I think you can. You can buy voter records, but it, it might, I, I don't think it has people's birth dates, though, but I'm trying to think of what else. It does. Oh, it does? I mean, because I know I've purchased sometimes for public figures if I want to see their voting history. That's something that can be purchased. 
through the Secretary of State's office. But and I think if you spend enough money, you could buy the records but, for the and, entire. And, and part of that is, you know, what you're at is, uh, you know, again, whether you make forty thousand or or forty million, there's a difference in what is affordable. Most people aren't going to be able to go out and and buy the entire voter registration file. And, and to get it from the Secretary of State, you have to agree not to use it for commercial purposes. Uh, and, and that's the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's part of the problem is that it's been republished online. Yeah. And, wait, wait, just, and the, anybody can access it. And when the state releases this information, you, you have to promise not to use it for anything that's not election or voter related. Mm -hmm. And so when you republish all of this information, the end user doesn't necessarily have to make that pr that promise. Because mm -hmm. they won't it, sell I mean, it to you if you were wanting to use it for marketing purposes. Or identity theft or right. yeah. any, anything like but, that. And so but that's you can go onto the is, website yeah. and... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's definitely... A privacy breach. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone's personal identifiable information is there. Mm -hmm. And it's being completely ignored by the state. Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. There's somebody over here. Okay. Well, thank you both for being here. It's fascinating. Um, I have a question that's a little bit broader. The Economist really recently published an article about the number of deaths worldwide of journalists. It's the highest this last year it's ever been. And, and that's, my question relates to, what are we seeing here that this is such a worldwide problem of aggression against journalists? Did I take I mean, a stab at this? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put a plug in for Maria Ressa's book, How to Stand Up to a Dictator, because she describes the process that happened in the Philippines, that's happening in the United States, that's happening in European countries, exactly step by step, and attacking journalists and killing journalists and shutting down journalism or public request for information is part step two, basically. So when you see, and she makes the case for and was one of the, I think, first people in the world to connect social media and algorithms with what kind of information you see and the disinformation traps you get into. So that's part of it. It's a very organized effort mm -hmm. but I mean, for years you know people have disagreed with you know I I was the editorial page editor uh, for the register for uh, five years and you know there were editorials that we wrote that even my family thought I ought to be uh, locked up <laughs> uh, but we've we've taken a step beyond that and now it is, we've gone from disagreeing to, uh, uh, to almost hatred. And, you know, this used to be an issue in uh, other parts of the world, you know, and now you're seeing it, uh, you know, I mean, you've got members of the Iowa legislature who, uh, you know, are treating journalists uh, the way they are because you know, they think that they are evil because they're publishing what has, journalists have always done. You know, you, you find people on both sides of an issue and, and you, you lay it out and let the people decide what they want to, you know, believe. And now, you know, that's not, it's not enough. You know, I'm going to hate you for what you do and, and I'm going to do my darndest to silence you. And there are enough wackadoodles out there uh, who uh, will take it even a step further. And well, I mean, I will say I, I have never been afraid for my life 
covering Iowa politics, but I, in my past life covering Russian politics, there were several Russian journalists I used to read regularly who were murdered. And I mean, it was sobering. They, I, I wasn't doing investigative reporting in Russia and I wasn't reporting from a war zone, which is what happened to a couple of the journalists down there. But it is, it's amazing. There are a lot of brave people in the world willing to do this work in countries where it's very unsafe to be a reporter. I mean, you know, I've had the worst I've had to deal with is annoyance, not having access. But I haven't, I haven't ever felt that my life was being threatened. But it is scary. Sometimes the online harassment can be a little bit scary. But again, like I haven't dealt with death threats. It, that certainly does happen in the United States to journalists, though. And I know during the Trump presidency, there were a lot of political reporters who were getting death threats. Just a quick thing about the vouchers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, it, it was a slippery, bizarre, you know, two weeks. Um, but I think what we have to do now is um, challenge these schools. Uh, I am a product of private school. I'm in touch with them. I'm a donor. So I've emailed them this week, and I asked for a copy of their 990, which is an IRS document that I thought every nonprofit had to file. I did hear back from their uh, account, whatever, finance director, and said, per the IRS, we do not need, to, we are we're not required to do, which I'm going to continue to investigate. Mm -hmm. However, she did offer me the opportunity to stop by, and I could look at the information. Mm -hmm. So I, don't, I live 300 miles away from this school, but I am going to make an appointment and go, mm -hmm. because until we start holding these private schools accountable, because right now they have no disclosure responsibilities. They have very limited responsibilities in who they're going to take. And um, I mean, I think a grave injustice has been done. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to not just be defeated. And we need to keep problem solving and speaking up and, and taking this information from this forum tonight. Because this is invaluable. Mm -hmm. and, and keep raising questions. Mm -hmm. Because I know and go to those legislative forums as much. I've been to many of them. And I, I kind of got away from because I just sort of got sick of the BS. Mm -hmm. But um, I pr applaud the league for continuing to have them. Oh, it's very helpful. There was a question over here. This, one, this person's been asked for me to ask a question. I think after this question, we'll have time for one more, maybe. and then we're, Oh, maybe. shoot. I thought I'd be the final act. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, again, thank you both for being here. appreciate it. I've read you both for quite a while, so I appreciate your work. Thank you for reading. Um, one of the things that I've noticed this year, I believe there's like 39 brand new legislators in this session. Mm -hmm. This bill came up and it's completely different from the previous um, notorious entities that were created. Um, who wrote that bill? There was not enough time to put, these, put this together. It makes me suspicious when Betsy DeVos, who is an absolute hater of public schools, and who knows if Alec was involved in this or not, but who wrote the bill? And why didn't they get a chance to even review it briefly before they had to have these marathon um, overnight sessions to get this thing passed in three days? Well, it was a governor's office bill that the governor's office can file legislation. So, and I don't know how long the governor's staff was working with the Legislative Services Agency to draft the bill, but as for who wrote it, I mean, there are similar proposals are coming up in Utah and Arkansas. So it's very likely that there were national organizations that were involved in drafting the provisions of this bill. But it, I mean, it, it was drafted and it was drafted before the session started. I mean, it wasn't filed until after the governor's condition of the state speech, but it's not something that they just whipped up in a day or two. That was obviously weeks of work went into drafting the bill. Mm -hmm. It's practically word for word mm -hmm. of the Florida legislation. Right. And there are model, a lot, there are a lot of organizations that offer model legislation on their pet issues, and it's not always bad. Sometimes it's good, sometimes we can learn from things that other states have done well. So, and it, it's not only conservative organizations that encourage legislators to introduce model legislation, but in this case, you know, this is, this is an unpopular proposal. 
that say, I mean, I think there were certain Iowa tweaks to it. I don't know that it, that the school vouchers was exactly the same as what has, was proposed in other states, but it's similar. The, the overall look of it is similar. Mm -hmm. I have one question, and this is still on the legislature, but a little bit different. And one thing that hasn't come up in here that I've noticed is the silence for information on the floor. And mm -hmm. let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, a good example to me is the redistricting, where there was a redistricting proposal that came through the commission. It came through to the floor. I forget if it was the House or the Senate. Mm -hmm. And effectively, every Democrat got up and said what they thought about it, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And then one Republican lawmaker came up, gave a very vague speech about the matter. Voting went through. All of the, all of the Republicans came down and voted together. Mm -hmm. So clearly this had been decided in caucus. Mm -hmm. And I know that there is no real, there's no open meeting laws for that, but are there any levers for that? Because I worry about that a lot. And so it's part of my background academically. It's not what I work in. was in Roman history. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> right, <laughs> uh, I did Greek and Latin and such. And so my, my master's work was in that. And there is a very noticeable difference when you shift from the Republic to the Empire, because in the Republic, where everything's got public debate, the matter, like the, the dis discourse you get about uh, issues is about the issues that everybody has access to. And once you get past that, then you talk about the people involved. Mm -hmm. because the only people, like, the public doesn't have access to that. Mm -hmm. So I'm really not happy about being a, in a position where to understand what's happening in the legislature, I have to know who Pat Grassley is and wonder if Alec is writing the bills because I don't have access to the information that the Republican caucus is using to make decisions. Well, it's, there, it's clear that decisions on... Almost every bill are made prior to the beginning of the debate. And I have had many conversations with former legislators who served during the 70s, 80s, or 90s, and including Andy McKean, who served for a long time in the 80s and 90s. Then he went, he retired from the legislature to be a county supervisor, and he came back to the legislature, was elected in 2016. And he was alarmed by what he saw, the culture difference that he said there really there used to be real debates and people would listen and sometimes the minority party's amendment might even be adopted because people thought that they made a strong case everything that happens on the floor of the house and senate now is basically pre-scripted i mean the, the majority party hasn't accepted a democratic amendment on a significant bill that i can think of in years i mean i just don't even know what that would be and people don't listen and in fact something that i've noticed this happened a few times a couple of years ago where the Democratic leader in the House made a quorum call because many of the Republican legislators don't even sit at their desks on the floor during the debate. They hang out in back offices, and when there's a vote on an amendment or the vote on final passage, they come back and vote, and then they all stream right out of the room again. So they're not even listening to what anybody is saying about any of the amendments. And uh, I, I, I mean, I've, sometimes you can see just even not being in the chamber, you can just see from the camera, you see the people streaming in the door and they go and they push the buttons and then they stream right back out. So it is a big concern. I don't know what can be done about it because as Randy said, I mean, the legislative rules, I mean, they're not subject to any open records or open meetings laws. And so they, but they, things are being decided in caucus well before any debate, and there's not, the, the free flow of an exchange of ideas is pretty non-existent, I would say, in the Iowa legislature right now. I mean, when I started, you know, back in the last century, uh, you know, the legislators, you know, while they, they had a D after their name or they had an R after their name, you know, they were there to improve a bill, uh, you know, and that's what the whole purpose of amendments and debate was all about, and, and it was not like there was any, uh, there was the right way to go and the wrong way to go. They disagreed on things, and you would find people of the same party, you know, sometimes disagreeing, and, and now there isn't that give and take, and, you know, and some of the old uh, guard lawmakers that I knew back when I worked for a living, you know, their uh, blood pressure is as high as as mine, you know, because they don't like what they see now any more than many of you 
like what you see. But, you know, what I would tell you is that the, uh, you know, the founders of the League of Women Voters, uh, you know, they were never shy about expressing their <laughs> opinions. And I think that is uh, sort of the, the key takeaway from all of this is, you know, if you don't like what's going on, don't be bashful. Uh, you're not going to step on anybody's toes. Or if you do, they probably deserve to have their toes stepped on. But, you know, whether it is uh, social media postings, whether it is letters to the editor in the Gazette uh, or whatever, find ways to uh, let people know. Write letters to the your uh, senators and representatives, both state and federal, because, you know, you don't want to give them an excuse of, well, nobody expressed that opinion to me. They do say well, that. Well, I know, but, <laughs> but you will at least sleep sounder at night. <laughs> we appreciate that advice. Thank you very, very much to Randy Evans and Laura Bellin. Round of applause.